everyone. Hi, folks. A few folks are still joining us, so we'll just give it another second here. Hello. Hi. Hi, folks. Well, welcome back uh, to this week's Meet the Candidates um, video call. Thank you so, so much for being here with us tonight or this afternoon, wherever you are. But thank you for taking the time to, to join us um, and making this part of your weekly routine now. Uh, so we are so excited to have Georgette Gomez uh, running in California's 53rd Congressional District here with us tonight. We also appreciate our partners at LGBTQ Victory Fund. They're co-hosting this event with us. So thank you to Ali and Sean and, and all of the, our friends there. Um, we'll also briefly hear from former California State Senator Kristen Kehoe. We're also grateful to have her here as well. Um, but you all know the drill and our pros. You guys are here every week with us. So, but very briefly for new folks on the line, uh, a few programmatic notes. Uh, if you're comfortable with it, please go ahead and flip on your videos. I think we're all craving more engagement. Let's all see each other. Um, when you're ready to ask your question, you'll just go down to the very bottom. You'll see a chat icon. It'll say Rachel PCC host. And please go ahead, feel free to send me your chat uh, at any point, your question at any point during the event. Uh, Georgette is eager to answer them and, and hear from you. So. Um, please forgive me, bear with me in advance if I can't get to your question. Um, there's a lot of folks and we're, I'm going to try my very, very best. I promise you if I don't, um, if you, we will send you my email and I will get your question answered and I will connect you to the best person um, on Georgia's uh, campaign. Uh, so we'll be live streaming this. We're also recording this. So no worries if you're jumping in a little bit late. Uh, if you have to jump off a little bit early, I will send you a recording of this video uh, so that you can watch at your convenience later. Um, and as you folks know, you know, these calls don't cost anything, uh, but we really do hope that if you feel compelled uh, and inspired by Georgette and what you hear uh, about her tonight, from her tonight, that you'll consider making a contribution uh, of something you feel comfortable with. Um, every dollar counts. Um, it would be deeply appreciated. Uh, and if that's something you could consider, we would be grateful for that. So let me go ahead, let's dig in and let me turn this over to our co-founder, Dr. Stephanie Taylor. Stephanie? Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, well, first of all, I'm excited to start tonight with a victory report. Uh, two of our endorsed candidates in Texas, Candace Valenzuela and Mike Siegel, whom many of you met before in previous Meet the Candidate calls, both won their primaries or their general, their runoff election runoffs last night in Texas. Um, so now they are going on to the general election. And um, both are in great positions to beat the Republicans. So we're really excited about that. And tonight we are going to be meeting another general election candidate. And that is Georgette Gomez, who is running in California's 53rd congressional district. This is a blue seat that's been opened up um, by incumbent Susan Davis's retirement. Um, Georgette is a lifelong community organizer. Her parents were um, undocumented, they worked minimum wage jobs, and as she told me once, um, she learned at a very early age that government has enormous influence over our lives, for better or for worse, and that's driven her into public service. She became an environmental organizer and then went on to become the first LGBTQ Latina on the San Diego City Council where she's led the fight against Trump's border wall. Uh, Georgette is endorsed by a slew of um, progressive organizations, progressive power players. Um, she's endorsed by Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. Um, she's endorsed by local unions, by the California Democratic Party, Sierra Club. Uh, Georgette is also running um, against a Democrat for the general election because California, as you may know, is a uh, two top vote, the two top vote getters in the primary go on to the general election. And in this case, they were both Democrats. Um, Georgette is running against a woman named Sarah Jacobs, who is the granddaughter of billionaires and has been district shopping. She ran in another district and lost that primary. And now she's running in this district. Um, the differences between Georgette and Sarah and Sarah and Georgette um, are enormous. And Obviously, we're very excited to endorse Georgette Gomez, who we think would be a phenomenal congresswoman for this district. And so with that, let me welcome Georgette Gomez. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, uh, Rachel. And thank you, everybody, for 
for participating in this in this discussion. Hopefully, you'll get a, a little sense of who I am and what my motives are in deciding to run for for Congress. I'm 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 extremely excited to be able to be allowed to have this opportunity. And I say that because uh, as as when I was getting introduced, I'm a daughter of immigrant parents, uh, first generation Mexican American was born in San Diego, have stayed in San Diego, was born in a very low income community. And in fact, the community that uh, government decided to concentrate a lot of the heavy industrial uh, businesses, which is was one of my motivations to really start as I was growing up and learning the impacts of, of having these industries as neighbors, uh, growing up as a child, um, going to a open space. Uh, my park was surrounded by freeways. Uh, my grocery store was a liquor store. So this is a, a, not a unique story, unfortunately. It's a story that continues to perpetuate in low-income communities, communities of color. And that has been my motivation in getting engaged in uh, creating a better government at any level. Um, I think uh, all, all, all governments, local, state, and, and the federal government, have strong responsibilities to really address these inequalities that we have as a nation. Um, and uh, that, that's why I've been doing what I've been doing. I've dedicated my entire life in fighting for inclusion, fighting for justice, uh, pushing on government as a or community organizer, as a public policy advocate for over a decade, um, and then decided to push myself and uh, put myself out there and become an elected. I wasn't supposed to uh, win my first election, but definitely very honored to have earned the, the trust of community members. Uh, they got behind in my election and we were able to succeed then. And I know for a fact that now that we're running for Congress, we're gonna do it again uh, because people do believe in making sure that government is working for the people. And that's why I'm running to make sure that our government is still addressing, that state government is addressing these uh, inequalities that we're seeing right now because of COVID, where we are seeing quite an interesting dynamic right now. We're seeing all these different injustices from racial inequality, income inequality, environmental uh, justice issues, air quality issues are being exposed to what they are. And uh, we're seeing it play out as a society, uh, but more importantly, we have an opportunity to do what's right and uh, this is why I'm running, to ensure that we're bringing a stronger voice to DC, uh, one that is coming from the border, one that it, uh, has lived this experience firsthand and has dedicated her entire life and really pushing for, for better, better systems, systemic change. And I'm excited to be having this conversation about that today with all of you. Uh, but more importantly, this is why I'm running for the Congressional 53rd to really bring a strong progressive border voice uh, to DC. One, in fact, when I, when I first ran my election and won, we made history at the local level by electing the first queer Latina to city council, one that is progressive, that is rooted in community. And we're looking and making history yet again to be the first queer Latina, progressive queer, queer Latina to be sent to Congress. Uh, I have strong progressive values and I'm not gonna uh, waiver from that uh, when I become uh, the next congressional member and I'm looking forward and really pushing and bringing the the, the voices uh, to DC to ensure that we're creating better better systems for all. <laughs> Can't hear you Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. I was on mute. Sorry, folks. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Georgette. So um, I know we're eager to get to questions, but before we dive in there, um, we're also thrilled to be joined by uh, former California State Senator Christine uh, Kehoe. Uh, she's here with us uh, as well tonight and uh, is going to share a little bit about why this district uh, needs Georgette now and how she's going to win. So Christine, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Oh, Christine, we can't hear you. How's that? Better? Perfect. Right. Even I'm getting used to Google <laughs> uh, or Zoom. Hey, Georgette, uh, very, very nice remarks. I enjoyed uh, the comments I've heard from the first two speakers. And uh, it's wonderful to be talking to progressives out of town about how wonderful Georgette Gomez is. 
this some she is a candidate I truly believe in. Uh, I was the first LGBTQ person elected to uh, any uh, public office in San Diego County back in 1993. And uh, it gives me great pride to see uh, all the work that's been done since then. We have many people have been elected to the city council. We have uh, that are from the queer community. Uh, we have the leading candidate for mayor also uh, uh, from the queer community, Todd Gloria. But nobody makes me prouder than Georgette Gomez. Um, I did not know Georgette before she ran in 2016. Um, but I knew the organization she worked with, with for many years, the Environmental Health Coalition. And on the city council, I was more very familiar with the challenges that are being faced by the people who live in Barrio Logan, her home community. Um, I want the folks that are just uh, zooming in to know that San Diego is no longer just uh, that little Navy town south of Los Angeles. Uh, we are increasingly progressive. Uh, we have more Democratic registered voters uh, than the Republicans. Um, uh, as Georgette pointed out, no one expected her, very few expected us, her to win in 2016. She was the underdog, but she was consistent, hardworking, and smart, and she still is. But the San Diegan see in Georgette is her values and her authenticity. Uh, she was a dark horse coming in and won. And the next thing you know, she's elected chair of our regional transportation agency, which historically is dominated by our suburban Republican cities. Then she was elected unanimously council president, also with strong Republican votes. She is a true progressive, but she gets the things done across the board. Uh, she, when you meet Georgette, you know that she is an honest, smart, uh, value-driven woman who is going to make the right uh, decisions every time. Um, this is an urgent race. Uh, we have got to get her in uh, to this seat. Uh, it makes me uh, feel very bad for San Diego when I think that a congressional district uh, could be purchased and go to the highest bidder. That is not the kind of candidate Georgette Gomez is. Uh, she works hard for every vote she gets. She listens and she is really rooted in the community. Um, I just uh, am glad you're all here. I think we should listen and hear those questions, but I couldn't be prouder to tell you I am, uh, I've endorsed Georgette every time I have been able to and I will continue to do so. And your help is deeply appreciated. Help us move San Diego. We want to win this congressional seat. Thank you so, so much. Cheers, cheers to that. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for taking the time to, to be here with us. Uh, all right, folks, let's dive into your questions. Georgette is eager to answer yeah. them. All right, up first, we are gonna have our friend, uh, Eduardo Soto. Uh, Eduardo, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself. And what is your question for Georgette? Hello, everybody, and thanks so much for having me. Uh, uh, I think I'm unmuted and everybody can hear me, so uh, that's great. Uh, Georgette, it is so great to hear your story and uh, to have an, a, a chance to meet you. My question for you is, is, is quite, of a, quite a BC insider question, uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to add a little wrinkle here, uh, the, an angle to it that I hope will make it more interesting. I'd like to ask you what committees, if you've given any thought to, to, to this, you would like to join uh, if elected. Uh, and uh, if I could add a, a second part to that, I would ask, you know, are, are there uh, members already on those committees or uh, potential future colleagues that you look forward to working with uh, in that capacity? Um, and that's my question. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, for that question. So I, I, I have been giving it some thought uh, just because um, I have been asked that question before. Uh, so the first time I, that I, asked, I was asked that question, I was like, whoa, uh, I, I don't know yet. I'm, I'm uh, focused on trying to win this race. <laughs> uh, that's where like, that's where I am right now, right? And that's what a, a candidate should be doing. But since then, I, I, I took Q and I started doing some research. And uh, let me just say that the, the, the areas that I've been focusing on as a, as a current uh, local elected have been around addressing our climate crisis, 
as well as our, our housing crisis. Those have been major. That's why when, uh, and, and let me just actually take a pause and say thank you, Christine, for your amazing introduction and your incredible unwavering support uh, to, to, to me as a mentor and as an endorser and as a, a huge uh, supporter of the campaign. I'm forever grateful and I, I'm very honored to, to, to have you in, the, in Team Gigi. So thank you for that and for everything that you've done for our community. Um, so. Always happy to do it, Georgette. Go, girl. <laughs> thank you. So um, going back to, to your question, Eduardo. So um, those have been the, the major issues that I've been focusing on. A lot, a, a lot, a, in addition to those two areas, and they're not, they're not small areas, um, has, it's also equity um, from, a, from a just an equity overall. Everything that we do as a, as a government agency, just really inserting uh, the importance of, of really prioritizing the communities that have been left behind, uh, just because we do have that opportunity and that responsibility as government uh, for making sure that we're, you know, whatever it might be, uh, but equity has been a major issue. Um, and so the area that the, there, there are two committees that I'm interested in and I'm, I'm, I'm following. One is the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, uh, being that, as Christine said, uh, when I came into, into council soon after, uh, that was the number one assignment that I asked from my, at the time, the council president to allow me to represent the, the San Diego and the local, um, the regional transportation body agency and also the regional transportation body agency. There's two, two bodies here that we have. And the idea has always been, I've been always been a huge advocate around transit, public transportation, and uh, in, in the lens of just uh, addressing um, opportunities to, to give to low income communities to have access to better education, better jobs, and just being able to move people in a faster, more efficient way and then you can tie the, the, the benefits from a climate, right? Uh, if we can have a real transit system, not only just regionally, but nationwide, um, I think we can do a significant uh, impact to our climate and reduce some of these green, green, green gas uh, uh, emissions that we're trying to tackle. Within all of that, uh, you also create great jobs uh, in terms of building the infrastructure um, not only would it be better for, you know, the environment, but it's also an opportunity to really create middle income jobs in the construction industry. So I do believe that, you know, putting more emphasis in, in trying to really figure out how to way we can infuse a significant amount of money uh, to really address uh, climate from a transit focus. I think that's an opportunity that we're, we're missing. So that's an area that I would love to come in and really uh, be part of. Um, and, and really sway it, sway it in that manner. Um, I haven't really looked at um, congressional members. Uh, I mean, I, I see the people that I've been honored enough to earn their support. I've been looking them up and seeing what they're doing and they're amazing. I have over 16 congressional members that have endorsed me from, uh, from AOC to uh, Pamela to Rokana. I mean, it's been pretty incredible all of them amazing congressional members that I look up to, um, a lot of California congressional members, um, and we were able to get some East uh, from, from, the, from, 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 from various different areas outside of California. So for me, it's always been about really building relationships with decision makers to be able to get buy-in on what you're trying to do. So I, I don't wanna leave anybody behind. So I want to be friends with everybody to really push it. And, you know, that's, a, that, that's the strategy that one has. So I don't want to just, uh, but at least start with the people that are supporting me and really getting behind. Um, the other area that I'm looking at is the education and labor. Uh, to me, education is the pillar of being able to build that middle class. Uh, but education can have many different components, right? We always think about a university, colleges, uh, there's building, there, there's uh, other uh, other venues that we really need to reconsider. But at the at the end of the day, I think we're getting away from at least DC is getting away from really supporting public education. Uh, most of the responsibility right now is now falling on the states. 
uh, to invest in their education. And I think that has to change. Uh, so that definitely is another area that I, that I really care about in making it more accessible and equitable. Um, and I mean, I'll leave it at that because I, I mean, there's housing. Uh, housing is a major issue. Uh, California is becoming extremely, extremely inaccessible in terms of becoming very expensive. Um, and that's a story that really uh, can be, now it's expanding to other states. So I just do definitely do think that we need to have a stronger conversation about housing and making it accessible to people. Um, I, I mean, one of the, the things that we all know in terms of building equity is home ownership, and that is becoming a, a, a dying dream in our society. And we really need to think about that, what that means in terms of income, income growth in, in the, manner, in the manners of, of the economics that we currently have in our system. Um, if we're going to shift it, then okay, let's talk about what that means. So the, those, those are also major issues that I care about. So. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Soto. Thank you, Georgette. Mm -hmm. uh, up next, we have our friend Morris Pearl. Morris, what's your question for Georgette? Hi, I'm Morris Pearl from New York. And the most important vote any congressperson takes is the very first day of which party of the Democrats or Republicans will control the House. I was wondering if you could outline after that what difference what differences you will really have from your opponent in terms of what policies you would support that are different than what your opponent would support. Yeah, I think um, I, I, my this is my perspective, and my perspective on this is it's not so much on the policies, but it's in the experience and the experience and the live experience that one has. Um, as, as, a, as the beginning, because you can look at a website where for Medical for All, where for the Green New Deal. Um, so all of that checks, right? Everything is pretty similar. Uh, the literally the differences is our background and our professional experience. I daughter of immigrant parents. I, I know firsthand the importance of addressing immigration reform. I lived it. I, I had two parents that came here undocumented and saw how they suffered. Uh, how they were abused and their work site, um, how their status was being waived. If you complain that this is what we'll do. Um, my, my, both my, my sister and my, my brother um, had a difficult time. They, yes, they were successful in graduating from college, but it was not easy. My sister had to get two different jobs because she wasn't able, even though she qualified income wise from getting government assistance, but because she didn't have the documentation Eventually, all of them were able to to get it, but I understand firsthand what that means. Um, that's something that I bring. I mean, I grew up pretty poor. Uh, at times, we we had housing insecurity. Um, I know what all of the so I know the challenges that working families are going through because I lived them. Uh, that is why I'm in this. I'm not in this because I want the title. I'm in this because I truly want to shift the the policies. I don't just want to vote. Uh, for good policies, but I want to drive the policies that are addressing people's quality of life and lifting people from poverty and stopping this paycheck to paycheck lifestyle. It's not healthy, and we really need to address that. Now, my opponent comes from a different background, and there's nothing to say. I mean, she's lucky that she grew up pretty wealthy. Um, she hasn't had a, a, a longer job than a, a year. Uh, she's been shopping around for uh, to become a congressional member just two years ago, north from here. She was running in a different district, right? Patients are different. Um, and uh, I have to say that for me, government, the reason that sometimes government is not addressing the regular uh, working family issues is because we elect people that are detached. And I think that has to change. And we're seeing the pressures of the people right now in the streets firsthand that they're tired of that and they want government elected to actually do the work for the people. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Morris. Thank you, Georgette. Uh, okay, you folks, uh, you all know our, co our other co-founder, Adam Green. He uh, is gonna actually jump in here and share a, a story that fits right in with this. Adam, the floor is yours. All right, hey, Georgette. Hello, Adam. I am um, I'm known as Stephanie's less eloquent co-founder. Um, <laughs> so, my, my, my question actually um, stems right off the point that you were just making in, in Morris's 
question as well. And I actually want to kind of share an anecdote. Um, you know, we, we are proud to have helped defeat Sarah Jacobs last cycle when she ran against um, now Congressman Mike Levin, you know, more from the right as a corporate Democrat in the California 49 district. And I just want to share one, I didn't really know much about her until I attended a candidate forum. I happened to be out there at the time that it took place. And it really cements the point that you were making about lived experience. Um, a question came up about the San Onofre nuclear power plant, which I guess is located in that district. Yep. And the basic question was, what do you think about it being here? Do you want it here? And everybody pretty much had a boilerplate answer of, you know, we'd rather not have it in our district. And they left it there. Sarah went a step further. She said, you know, when I was, you, know, you mentioned she only had years, you know, a one year job at a time. When I was a, basically a junior staffer in the Obama State Department, we had a policy there called voluntary consent. And I was like, huh, I wonder what that is. And then she said, you know, there are some communities that are so poor that, and they need money so bad that they would gladly take the money in exchange for consenting to having a nuclear power plant in their district. So that's the right way to get rid of it from our district. And I just looked around the room. I'm like, am I the only person that heard that? Like that is so classist, right? She basically, she's saying communities that are so desperate and on the brink of poverty might be willing to take a little bit of money in the short term for their kids to have cancer in the long term, yeah. right? And my thought was exactly what you just said, which is, wow, I don't think she's malevolent. I just think that her life experience, you know, being the daughter of someone who invented Qualcomm and is like a, you know, hundred of millionaire and that's the life she's grown up with, she did not associate that with being kind of a, a justice, an environmental justice, an economic justice issue. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know, I, I actually am kind of curious whether you think that she would actually be there as a fighter on issues like the Green New Deal and Medicare for All, given her life experience, or is she kind of paying lip service to that, you know, while you would be a little bit more of a champion? Yeah, well, I mean, I can, I can tell you that <clears throat> since uh, we've been, since we started our campaign, Obviously, I, I we've been spending some time and learning who my opponent is, and uh, you know, it, it, yeah, she 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 comes from wealth, and she herself has has to inherit that wealth, right? Um, I have I had worked uh, everything that I have I've worked for, um, even the position that I have right now as the council president I worked for. Nobody gave it to me um doing this campaign i'm working my butt off to to make it happen um and and so so we did some research on, on my opponent and uh one of the things that we have learned is that yes although she does claim that she's medical for medic for all in the green new deal and all like the new things that are popular in the progressive movement um she also you know is a, an investor in these in these in these industries um, so how you how how you manage that? You're making money. Um, you're continuing to grow your wealth uh, based on you know uh, on on the on the pharmaceutical industry or or you know industries that are fossil fuel uh, driven. Uh, that's that's something that she really is going to need to figure out um, if 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 she is the one that succeeds. But we're gonna make sure that it doesn't happen, right? Um, it, I, I just, I, I don't know. I can't speak to what, all I know is what I'll do. All I know is what I've done. I've dedicated my entire life addressing environmental justice at the local level, at the state level. And even when Obama was president, uh, participated in creating the sustainability pilot efforts that he was trying to move forward. It was a partnership with uh, HUD, the transportation, uh, department and also um, um, EPA. Um, and the idea is to really bring all these different uh, departments together to really try to infuse resources and support to communities of concern, meaning EJ communities, and start working in different levels. So that's what I dedicated my entire life and that's what I'll continue pushing for. Um, it is time that we really prioritize different communities that have been left behind now. And I know the Green New Deal and all these different progressive 
uh, efforts that are currently going on in DC are the right approach. And in order for us to advance them, we need to start electing people that have that drive, not just because you read an article or you read the bill, so therefore I'm there. We need people that understand it, that have that experience firsthand to really push because they're not easy fights whatsoever. Um, and uh, I, I can only tell you what I'll do. Um, and, 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 that's, 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 that, and that's why this is important. We have an opportunity. Yes, this is a D and D, but two different Ds, two different experiences, two different journeys. Um, and the drive on, in terms of why we're doing it, I can tell you that for me, it's always been about the communities. It's always been about the issues and really creating a different government that is lifting people out of poverty. By doing it also, while we also protect our environment, it's not just at any cost. Uh, the, 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 the trickle down econ economics hasn't worked, will not work, and we need to shift that. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, George Jett. Uh, mm -hmm. Up next, we have uh, our friend Ebony Murphy Root. Uh, Ms. Ebony, what is your question for Georgette? Hi, Georgette. I Hi. am a oh, and I'm, I'm a teacher yeah. in Santa Monica. I live in Long Beach, and I was really impressed by how quickly San Diego came out with a plan for the schools in the fall. Um, a lot of parents that I talked to were super worried about how it's going to work. A lot of people felt it didn't work well for them in the spring. I happen to think it can work, but how can we as a society support teachers and students and their families to offer a comprehensive education experience while we're all still safe at home? Because I don't want to get sick. I don't want my students or their families to get sick. I, I'm, I'm really glad that San Diego, San Diego came out early leading in this area for the rest of the country. So how can we, now that San Diego's made the plan, support students and their families in a way that makes their parents feel uh, ready to do this? Yeah, no, and I definitely think that um, that, that is uh, a, a critical conversation that needs to be occurring in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. right now, just because we're, we're constantly talking right now. I mean, I can tell you that as an elected, we're, one of the biggest conversations that we're having, and we tend to forget about the, the details of, okay, in order for this to work, how do we make it work, right, which is the huge pressure in, in, in all uh, uh, levels of government is let's open up the economy, right? Um, at, at, any, at any cost, uh, which is very scary, um, uh, just because that's not the right, that's not the right uh, objective. It's more about, okay, how do we address this health crisis in the way that we're minimizing people's, uh, um, min minimizing people from dying or, uh, you know, getting COVID, right? That should be the priority. Priority number one should be that. And then within all of that, how do we support the folks that are in the front lines that are critical? Education is one of those, I think, from my perspective. So we need to figure out how we adjust it and be able to support only the teachers, but also the parents that are now being asked to teach at home. Uh, to think about uh, 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 elementary school uh, child to, to get in front of a computer, right? And, and right now, I guess uh, children are not, now more susceptible to technology. Um, I think um, they, 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 they're, they're more used to it, so it's, it's, it's easier. Uh, but we also need to, one of the things that I've been driving home, and I think this is something that we really need to push at, at, in, in, in Washington, D.C., is a give give more resources to teachers uh, to be able to to manage the the workload because now you're being asked to you know do more over internet be not only be a counselor now you're becoming a health uh, a health supporter right and then you have to manage the education online um, I know you know my partner is a professor and uh, I I just I saw the 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 amount of work that just elevated or you already overworked with COVID or no COVID right uh, but then COVID comes and you're being asked to do even more uh, to do your lessons re pre record them and then have them live and then follow up and have you know online uh, you have to check in with your students and it just becomes a lot. So you need to, as educators, there needs to be more money to ensure that you're getting more support. Um, and that's not occurring. There's no more money attached to the requirements of teachers. 
Uh, we need to have more counselors because right now the, the mental impacts that are occurring in their society and within their youth is just dramatic. Uh, so there needs to be more resources for me me mental health. Uh, there needs to be also some support for parents because uh, if you really think about it, parents are being asked to become an educator. Oh, and while you're doing that, you also have to do your full-time job. Uh, so we got to really address that because just everything just happens so fast, but we haven't shift and we haven't shifted. And then let's not forget, not all community members have access to this technology. So we're, we, we and, and, and I'm really proud of San Diego Unify here because they were able to figure out the digital divide and support that. And that now actually through the budget that we just adopted at the city of San Diego, I was able to at least allocate half a million dollars to start a digital divide program at the, at the city. So I'm hoping that we can partner with the school district to really enhance that program. But I'm saying that because that's real and the government has to address the digital divide. We've always had it, now we're seeing it, and life has become all about, you know, con connecting through, through, through this, these technologies, but we still have a lot of families that don't have access to it because of already the income disparities that we had, and they're even getting greater. So that's another thing that DC really needs to step up and really push the digital divide conversation um, because I know that they've been trying, but it's been blocked because of because of some of these industries that are trying to, you know, make money off of it. But I think they really, it's an opportunity to uplift the digital divide conversation in DC. So there's a lot to say there, uh, but at the end of the day, there needs to be a conversation in terms of prioritizing education. Uh, there needs to be more support for, for teachers. There needs to be more counseling. And then really the, the, the technology divide is really critical. Thank you, Ebony, uh, for the thoughtful question. Thank you, Georgette, for the thoughtful response. Uh, yes, folks, sir. I think I'm gonna, I think we have time to sneak in one more question. Bear with me, forgive me, please. If I didn't get your question, I promise I will loop back with you and we will, we will get you an answer. Um, so bear with me, please. Um, Richard Blake, uh, Richard, uh, you have a question for Georgette. Uh, would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it? Richard? Okay, I will ask Richard um, Richard's question. Uh, so Georgette, Richard said, if elected, will Georgette um, support uh, We the People Amendment, higher taxes on the rich, 10% um, of more cuts to military budget? Do you have a few last thoughts on, on that last question? Uh, definitely, I mean, I, I think the, the taxation inequalities that we have need to be addressed. Um, we have some, you know, very wealthy families that are that that are not paying their fair share and we have some significant uh, major companies that are also not paying their share if not at all so all of that needs to be addressed in terms of uh military definitely supportive of we have to have a conversation of what that means uh disclaimer san diego is a military town uh so gotta think also talk about that because I also argue that there needs to be reshifting of that money that military gets. Um, you know, the, the, the families, uh, sometimes it's, it's about just the, the worker that is the member of the military, but their spouses or children, and we don't support them. Um, there, we have a lot of veterans that are living in the streets uh, and uh, that needs to be addressed. The, 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 the vet hospitals are great, but they've been, chipped away over the years to privatize, uh, that has to be restored. So that does, does, does that mean less money or reshifting of the money to really prioritize? So it is a conversation that I'm 100% behind in having and reshifting priorities. It's really important. Great. Thank you, Georgia. Um, thank you to everyone for the great questions and to Georgia for your answers. We are almost out of time. Um, I love how much we learn about the candidates on these calls. And speaking of that, this is our last scheduled Meet the Candidates call for now. Um, we're going to take a short break and then we'll be back with another series uh, to talk to our general election candidates as they move closer to the election so they can give us updates about their state of their races. Um, in the meantime, please do consider supporting Georgette. 
Uh, she needs the support. We need to win this race. Uh, Georgette, do you have any final thoughts for us to leave us with today? Well, I'll just uh, continue in that sentence. I mean, definitely, uh, if you can, if you're able to um, help us out, uh, either donate and uh, right now because of COVID, a lot of our outreach can be done from anywhere in the world um, because it will be over social media. It will be texting, calling. So all of that, it can be done uh, from your comfort of your wherever you live. Uh, so definitely, if you're interested in helping us connect with voters, uh, reach out. We're more than happy to plug you in. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's time that we continue to add new progressive voices to, to D.C., uh, our agenda is it's very doable, but it will only happen if we start building that bench. And I know that the bench is getting uh, it's, it's adding new people already, but let's continue adding more to ensure that we get this done. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your incredible support. And uh, thank you also for the very fruitful conversation today. Thank you so, so much, Stephanie and Adam, and especially Georgette and Christine, um, and to you all that took the time to, to join us. Um, if you can chip in, please, please do. Every dollar counts. Um, we believe you're inspired by Georgette like, like we are, um, and she can and will, 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 will win this. Um, yes. so thank you for taking the time. I will send you my email. Uh, if I didn't get your question, just give me a day or so. I promise I will get back to you. We will send you the recording. Um, and until we see you next time, stay safe, stay positive, stay well. And thank you so much for joining us. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Thank you.